Hello guys, I am Dr. Sajad Pathan and I welcome you once again to an episode where we are going to look at five single best answers for the MR Chem Oblique FR Chem SBA exams. Here I am going to touch on the SLO7, the Specialty Learning Outcome 7, where there are 10 questions which will be asked. If you look at the regulations guidance given by the college regarding the content of the MRKM Intermediate or the FRKM Final SBA exams, it is very clear that they will be asking 10 questions out of 180 from the SLO 7, which is your legal framework of practice and deals with certain issues such as complex challenging situations where there is you are tested for legal procedures and organ donation and other sensitive issues. Approximately these 10 questions out of 180 means about 5% and what you got to read is the 10 to 15 pages which is given in the Ashish Banerjee book as the legal aspects of emergency medicine. For those appearing for the FRKM final examination, I would ask them to reflect a bit more in the management portfolio aspect and deal with more challenging situations but for the MRKM intermediate I think that much information should suffice. So uh, what does this SLO7 consist of? It's the legislation legal framework, organ tissue donation, information governance, safeguarding of adults and children, evidence and guidelines. These are the five things which we are going to deal with today. So let us not waste further time and see the first question for the day. The question states that a five-year-old girl is in the emergency department with fever and vomiting. She is not compliant with assessment and management as she appears to be in distress. Her grandmother is with the child. The grandmother is unwilling to allow you to cannulate and take bloods despite the capillary gas showing a lactate of 8.1. Although you contemplate septicemia as a cause, patient's mother arrives soon and has consented to do everything to save the child. You decide to provide minimal restraint to and treat her with antibiotics because let us look at the options. You were acting in the child's best interest despite you are not allowed to supersede the grandmother's and patient's refusal. Patient's mother has parental responsibility. The guidelines on sepsis demand antibiotic at an hour children under 16 can usually consent for treatment and you should make decisions in their best interest in emergency situations. You could seek a court order to be obtained in such cases. Seems like a tricky one. Fortunately, we don't see such scenarios quite often. Parents are usually very compliant in giving us consent when we explain to them what is our rationale for doing a particular set of tasks. So, who can consent? Every competent adult is eligible for consent. Do you think you need a written consent for everything? No, that's untrue. A verbal consent or an implied consent is enough. Young persons, young person of any age can be considered to be competent as per the Gillick competencies and Fraser guidelines. At 16, with presumption that they have capacity and are competent, they can consent. However, less than 18, if they lack capacity, parental consent is needed. And if somebody is not able to be assessed for capacity, the lasting power of attorney can consent on behalf of the patient. So what exactly is Fraser guidelines? So what happens is it is issued in context that the patient is seeking care related to sexual health, contraceptive advice and treatment. For those who are under 16, who are classified as they are not competent or to consent. But here, Fraser guideline says that they, if they are having a capacity to understand and decide, they can be considered as competent and can consent for treatment related to sexual health. So the next question is who can consent for children? Anyone with a parental responsibility, mother automatically, father if his name is on the birth certificate of or he is married to the mother. Okay, legally appointed guardian can consent, 
person with residence order or designated local authority can consent. So this is there. If no one is available to consent in case of a child, who will do it? If it's an emergency, you can make a decision for the child in the child's best interest. So if you look at the scenario again, what is the answer over here? You went ahead and did the procedure despite the patient not consenting and the grandmother not allowing. The answer here is the mother has consented. She has the parental responsibility and you will act in the best interest of the patient. So option number two is the most likely right answer. Let us now look at question number two. 52 year old male is in the emergency department with shortness of breath and hypoxia. He has history of asthma and is morbidly obese. His chest is crackly all over and chest x-ray shows fluffy infiltrates diffusely. A diagnosis of COVID is considered and dexamethasone is administered along with a bronchodilator. You discuss DNAR order with the patient as you feel he may not be the candidate for intensive care ventilation in a resource starved situation. The patient wants a full resuscitation. What would you do now? Let us look at the options. DNR is a clinical decision and you along with a senior colleague can overrule the patient's wishes. Patient should be offered full resuscitation if there is no previous DNR. Patient's capacity should be assessed now. Deprivation of Liberty Act can be applied. DNAR is a clinical decision and if there is a previous definite DNAR for past admission that can supersede the patient's wish. Take a pause for 10 seconds and decide your answer. Let us now look at the explanation given. DNAR is a clinical decision. You guys should know this. DNAR is a clinical decision. Patient cannot demand to be resuscitated if the team feels that it is inappropriate to do certain thing. Second opinion is usually required. So majority of the trust over here will have two clinicians signing at the end of the DNAR form. Remember to fill in the treatment escalation plan that what is acceptable and what is not acceptable always for these patients. Yes, DNA does not mean that you stop all the treatment. Treatment should be carried out as per the treatment escalation plan. Previous definite DNA is valid only for that period, so cannot be applied now. So before looking at a previous DNA, please look whether it is definite or indefinite. Deprivation of Liberty Act is used to safeguard those adults who lack capacity to consent for care or treatment and is done in the best interest to protect them from further harm and capacity is often checked when patient refuses or patient is not in the right frame of mind to make a rational decision for themselves and can give consent to care capacity is patient is able to retain the information patient is patient understands what has been conveyed to them Patient weighs the pros and cons and then patient communicates the decision. So these four are the elements for capacity assessment. Let us now look at the answer. The answer here is DNAR is a clinical decision and you along with a senior colleague can overrule the patient's wishes. Let us now look at question number three. The police have arrested a 34 year old brought to him to the ED to assess his hand injury which he sustained while he stabbed another person the other person was earlier brought in with serious injuries and succumbed to his injuries in your department. On assessment and treating the patient's wound, you discharge him back to custody. So after you assess and treat, you discharge him back to custody. The police officer inquires about the previous victim's health just prior to discharge. What would you do at this point? You politely decline to state anything about the earlier victim or you state that he has succumbed to his injuries as the disclosure is required by law. You explain to the police officer politely that confidentiality to a person remains even after death and cannot be breached under any circumstances 
as this was a knife crime you should report details to the officer you can speak to the caldicat guardian and defense organization before you divulge any details let us take a pause for 10 seconds look at these options and decide our answer Before we look at the answer, let us look at the explanation given. Confidentiality to a patient should be respected and you cannot make any disclosures, any disclosures unless consented by the patient or required by the law or in public interest. Confidentiality remains even after that but can be broken or violated in certain special circumstances such as insurance claims or uh, Complaints, access to healthcare records, etc. Caldicate. Caldicate is a senior member which is appointed by every NHS organization who is responsible for information governance and data protection. You got to remember these things. So the answer over here is you would politely decline to the officer saying that you politely decline to state anything about the earlier victim. That's the answer. Let us now look at question number four. 52 year old trauma victim has sustained multiple injuries and a significant bleed in the brain parenchyma. His GCS was 3 on arrival and he has fixed pupils. The trauma team and the ITU team in the ED feels any attempt to do operative repair may be futile and a DNA order is placed. With regards to the organ tissue donation, what would you do now? The options are speak to the family and call the organ retrieval team. Call the organ donation helpline so that the specialist nurse can contact you back if the patient has an opt-in request. Call the organ donation helpline so that the specialist nurse can contact you back. Draw the routine bloods including viral markers, HLA compatibility and blood cultures in preparation for potential organ harvesting. Inform the organ donor referral team to come in as early as possible as there is a long list of patients waiting in your trust for liver, renal and corneal implant surgery. So this is a new part which has been added to the curriculum related to organ donation. What has been seen is we have potentially missed a lot of potential donors and the list of recipients or people who need the organs is quite long and is just expanding and potential donors could have been missed so it's not the duty of the intensive care team alone it's also the ED's duty to recognize these potential donors and start the process right from the ED so uh, in England there is nothing called as opt-in the law states that everybody over here has opted in by itself yes you are allowed to opt out by going online and do it but other than that everybody is opted in unless you go and opt out so everybody is a potential donor okay so the opt out system is valid if you are over 18 or you're exempted like you know patients who are excluded like patients who are visitors to England who have lived uh, here less than 12 months and who lack the mental capacity to understand the new arrangements and take the necessary action so that's for the opt-out so as I've said earlier this thing is something which has been far neglected in our emergency department we make very few referrals from ED and most ED physicians are not trained to discuss this so it's unwise for us to start the discussion so what we have to do is just identify and speak to the referral hot helpline and within 20 minutes the special specialist nurse for organ donations called as SNOD, S -N -O -D, will contact you back asking for further details and then you can go as per because they are very well trained in doing this kind of discussions with the family. So the answer is call the organ donation helpline so that a specialist nurse can call you back. Last question of this day is, a 11 year old Middle Eastern girl is in the emergency department with fever and pain in the abdomen. Her urine dipstick is positive for pus cells and nitrides. She was seen last month with a similar complaint 
and treated with antibiotics for a UTI. Her elder sister who is 19 years of age is with her as the mother cannot communicate in English. So the patient while she was getting examined she communicates to you stating that this is all started since that ceremonial thing which happened while she was she had visited to her mother's hometown. The elder sister then consoles her stating that it has nothing to do with that because even she had undergone similar ceremony years ago. So what would you do now? You will first option is inform the safeguarding lead, pediatric team and the police and give details such as name, age, address of the patient as needed using the red referral pathway. Second option is inform the safeguarding team for the elder sister using the red referral pathway and admit her in the hospitals. Third option is you are not legally responsible to inform the police. So just inform the safeguarding team. Fourth option is you should inform the police but do not give personal details as it would be a breach of confidentiality. Fifth is just ask your ED consultant to help you out with this mess as you have not seen anything like this. Let's take a pause for 10 seconds and then we will look at the explanation given. So the scenario over here describes with something called as female genital mutilation. This is very common in certain ethnicity, especially people from the Middle East, people from uh, Southeast Asia, people from Africa, African subcontinent. So uh, you need to identify these ceremonial practices, which they call it. And uh, whenever a patient communicates to you, if she's less than 18, you need to make the blue referral immediately. You will have to inform the safeguarding lead, the pediatric team and the police and have to give the details of the patient such as name, age and address as needed. It is your legal responsibility to inform the police. Just informing the safeguarding team will not be enough. For the girl above 18, you need to do the green referral system for the outpatient management. She does not need admission unless there are other safeguarding issues. Okay, so look at this algorithm. This has been taken from the Arkham website. I'll put the link down below for you to look at it. It's very beautifully designed algorithm. So the answer over here is the first option. You inform everyone to and do the red, red referral pathway. That's, that's all for this SLO7. Please put in your comments, like, share and subscribe to this channel and uh, I will see you soon with my next video with another 5 single best answer questions. Till then, stay safe, stay healthy, happy studying and peace.